What's going on, guys? Welcome back to episode 320 of Hashtag SGSM. Here today for Wednesday, January 15, 2020. I am Graham G.S. Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well. And I'm freaking pissed right now because I was sick a few weeks ago. I got better. I was fine. I was pretty much okay <clears throat> for last week's episode. And then all of a sudden, literally the worst timing ever. Yesterday, I started coughing again, which is why my voice is terrible today. I might be coughing up a storm, but we never miss a show. So here we go. Nonetheless, with episode 320, with your questions from Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. If you want to send in a question, please do so at WrestleRan on the Twitter machine with the hashtag AskGSM. Find me on Facebook as well, facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews. Leave your comment on the post I usually put up on the, uh, the post I usually put up on the Facebook page on Tuesday nights, if not on the wall itself. And last but certainly not least, drop your question down below in the comment section on this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. So we'll, uh, we'll get started here first with the YouTube questions. Uh, the episode may not be as long as usual just because I don't want to fucking uh, kill my voice even more than it already has been killed. But uh, nonetheless, Joe M. from YouTube, his first question was, of the 205 Live call-ups of 2019, excluding Tony Nese's random appearances, in an ideal world, I could easily see Mustafa Ali or Buddy Murphy becoming a world champion in the likes of Cedric Alexander, Humberto Carrillo, Okira Tozawa, and Drew Gulak all becoming mid-card champions, but I don't exactly see any of that happening. Out of 10, how would you score the main roster booking of each of them from 2019, and do you have high hopes for any of them for 2020? That's a good question. Um, yeah, not counting Tony Nese, because he was never drafted from 205 Live, um, you know, the same way that Akira was, and Carrillo, and, and Drew Gulak, he just, he is still on 205 Live, but he's also appearing on Raw, like, losing to Aleister Black, and, and people like that for, like, random reasons, Drew McIntyre, maybe, he was on the show a couple weeks ago, as recently as a few weeks ago, so, not really sure why, but, yeah, not, not really counting him, let's see, starting with Mustafa Ali, his main roster booking in 2019 partially wasn't WWE's fault, because, to their credit, they probably would have given him the Kofi Kingston push going into WrestleMania. It probably would have been Daniel Bryan and Mustafa Ali for the WWE Championship at that show had Ali not gotten hurt. Um, the thing is, is that when he was cleared to compete again, they didn't do anything with him. That's the part that sucks. So he came back like at WrestleMania. He was uh, right before... No, actually, he came back at Fastlane. He came back at Fast. <clears throat> came back at Fastlane, competed for the WWE Championship in that tremendous triple threat with uh, Daniel Bryan and Kevin Owens, and then they proceeded to do absolutely nothing with him. So again, the injury is at fault here too, but that's no excuse for how WWE just completely neglected the guy upon his return to the ring for the remainder of 2019. Uh, they could have put him in the mid-card title scene, they never did. They teased with him doing a tag team with Chad Gable for a while, that never really took off. Um, he was doing those vignettes like in the summer where he was like, oh, I'm not like any of you, blah, blah, blah which I thought were very cool, but they did nothing with them. They actually teased putting him in a program with Shinsuke Nakamura over the Intercontinental Championship, and I think Nakamura beat him on SmackDown, and that was it. Um, and then they kind of moved on from there. So his main roster booking, I mean, he's a solid mid-card guy. It's not like he was buried like some of the other people you mentioned. So his main roster booking, I would give about a, a 6 or a 7, maybe a 6.5, because he got over. People like Mustafa Ali's had really good matches, um, you know, the tag team matches he's had, singles matches he's had with Nakamura and other people like that. He was in the main event of the Money to Make pay-per-view before getting chucked off the ladder by Brock Lesnar. So he didn't have a failure of a year. It just could have been a lot better how they booked him better coming off of his injury in early 2019. So I would say about a, you know, I'll say a seven because <clears throat> at least he's a believable mid-carder now on the blue brand. Buddy Murphy wasn't even on SmackDown for like three or four months and then finally, they put him in that program accidentally with uh, Roman Reigns and Daniel Bryan, and he had some great matches with Roman, and then Bryan, he even beat. Um, that was a great match, too. And then he lost to Ali in the first round of the King of the Ring tournament, and then that was it. So I thought that was a bit bizarre. And then we didn't see him again after that. Um, I don't think he showed up on SmackDown in the remainder of his run there before he got drafted to Raw, and then he kind of picked momentum back up again. Um, and the feud with Alistair Black in the remainder of the year. So for him, I would probably give it a five because they li literally, for the first six months of his main roster run, they did nothing. Um, it wasn't a total failure just because he did have those two breakout matches with Roman Reigns and Daniel Bryan. 
The issue is they never really followed up on that. And he picked up a win over Daniel Bryan a lot like Ali did. And now he's a believable mid-carder, but really that all that stuff has happened in 2020. Um, he had the two great matches with Alistair late last year. He didn't win either of them, and then he lost to him again this past week. And now he's aligned with Seth Rollins, which is pretty cool. I'll get to that later. But in 2019, by and large, they did next to nothing with him, but it wasn't bad enough to the point where you know, he was on main event or whatever. At least he was doing something because he was doing the, um, you know, he had the little mini feud with Roman and Brian for a little bit, and he had those two great matches. So it wasn't a complete waste. Um, they're probably two of the better ones that got utilized. I mean, if I'm giving those guys fives and sixes, I mean, I'm, maybe I'm being generous there, but I, Ali, I would give a seven. For Murphy, I would give maybe a 5.5 because of those two matches with Brian and Roman. Everyone else was a total waste. Cedric Alexander, I would definitely give a five, like no higher than a five. Um, he became a viable mid-carder in 2019. He was another guy that got drafted to Raw, as he should have, and they proceeded to do nothing with him for like three or four months. He was on main event most of the time, and then he beat Drew, had a couple of good matches with Drew, a nice little mini feud there. He had a great run in the King of the Ring tournament, picked up wins over Sami Zayn and a few other people, that great match with Baron Corbin. He had a couple good matches with AJ Styles. So he had a pretty good 2019, you know, he won in the main event of Madison Square Garden before celebrating with Stone Cold Steve Austin. That was probably the peak of his push, because literally less than a week later, he lost to AJ in the kickoff show at Clash of Champions, and then it's been all downhill for him after that. I don't think he's even won a match on TV since that point, point. Um, and he hasn't been on TV in a couple of weeks, and when he has been, he's been losing, which sucks to say. So Cedric is a solid five. Um, you know, he became a viable mid-carder, he picked up a couple key wins there in the middle of the year, late last year, but then they completely fell off a fucking cliff with him, so, um, you know, maybe, probably a 5.5, a lot like Murphy, at least they utilized him a lot more than they did Murphy on SmackDown, so, it wasn't a total bust, but they didn't utilize him well at the beginning, they didn't utilize him well at the end either, <clears throat> at, at the end either, so, I'd probably give his booking a 5.5, if maybe not a little higher than Murphy, just because at least he was on TV more, and, um, you know, he had a lot of really good matches. I mean, Murphy had some great ones too, but, you know, that was maybe one or two or maybe three if we're pushing it. Alexander was on Raw, like, almost every week for about four or five months there in the final few months of 2019. Humberto Carrillo, I would give, you know, it's hard to say for the other ones you said, Carrillo, Tozawa, and Gulak, because they were all on the main roster for no more than three months. They got drafted in the 2019 draft in October. So it's kind of hard to rate what their main roster booking was. None of them were great, obviously. Carrillo, he lost and he lost and he lost before he finally started the win. I think he pinned AJ in a tag team match, and then he beat Andrade a few times. So um, he did pretty well for himself at the end. But in the beginning, I mean, he was, on again, on Raw every week, but he couldn't win a match to save his life. So I would give his main roster booking, again, off the three months that I saw of him last year, probably, I say, I think a four is too harsh maybe a 4.5, maybe I'm just being too harsh on these guys, but he didn't really do anything, he didn't get over in the beginning, he only really started to pick up momentum at the end, um, then we have Akira Tozawa, who they literally did nothing with when he went to Raw, the thing with Akira though that I've noticed is that he's on the show almost every single week, so it's better than nothing, Gulak is never on SmackDown, his main roster booking was a 1, they treated the guy like a loser, they could have capitalized off the momentum he had on 205 Live and really made him in the mid-card scene, but they didn't. They just reverted him back to being a joke, the whole PowerPoint shit. It was a total waste of him. Um, so his main roster booking is easily a one. Like, it, it was just terrible. Tozawa was at least on the show every week. I mean, granted, he has yet to win a match on the show, and not counting the 24-7 bullshit in New York City and whatever. Um... He hasn't done anything, so I would give his main roster booking a two, but at least he's going in there and having good matches with, you know, Drew McIntyre and Buddy Murphy and Andrade and people like that, so he's on the show almost every week, had a really good match a couple weeks ago with uh, Aleister Black, but um, yeah, a two because he didn't win any of those matches. Um, Joe's second question here, how old does it make you feel to know that the Nexus, as well as NXT in general, will be turning 10 years old in 2020? Holy shit, that's crazy. I was a freshman in high school when that show started, and a freshman, or yeah, I had just, or was just about to wrap up my freshman year of high school when the Nexus debuted in June of that same year. That's fucking nuts. And it really is crazy to think that 2010 was 10 years ago. I remember that very vividly. Having now been a wrestling fan for over 10 years, 
it starts to set in now that I've been a wrestling fan for so long. Not nearly as long as some of the as some of you guys, of course, but for 10 years, that's a long time. That's kind of like the threshold for me. To think that was all, you know, 10 years ago, NXT with the whole competition nonsense, which was such a shitty show, uh, but I watched anyway. I never missed an episode. And then the Nexus stuff, which was so great that summer. Um, I remember that so freaking vividly. It makes me feel very old. Now being 24, I was 13 when the show started. Um, I don't know, I'm sorry, I was 14 when the show started, and then I was 15 by the time the Nexus debuted, which again is crazy in retrospect. Um, let's see, Jeremy B. from Facebook, his question was, thoughts on Buddy Murphy being paired off with Seth Rollins and AOP? I like it a lot, I thought that was a neat little twist on at the end of Monday's Raw. So Murphy has since lost three matches to Aleister Black on Raw, which he should have. I don't like the 50-50 booking, the guy to keep Aleister undefeated. I love Buddy Murphy, but like, to have Alistair suffer his first loss to Buddy Murphy, of all people, would feel anticlimactic. So I'm glad they're keeping him undefeated. They had great matches, but it was time to move on. And they wasted no time in doing something with Buddy Murphy. He might even be in a better spot at this point than Alistair Black is. Because now he's aligned with the top heel faction on that show. Um, which is awesome. Buddy Murphy is really, really talented. He's a great talent. They've utilized him very well on Raw. You could tell that Paul Heyman writing Raw is a very big fan of Buddy Murphy. Because the guy's been on the show almost every week in the last three months. He's won far more than he's lost. I know he lost three straight matches to Alistair, but other than that, he hasn't lost on Raw at all. He beat Cedric. He beat Akira. He beat a bunch of other people, too. Um, So you could tell that Paul Heyman's a big Buddy Murphy guy, as he should be. The guy's very good. Um, So I like the addition of Murphy to the stable. I know I saw some people saying, I think it was actually you, Jeremy, who tweeted me on Monday saying that, you know, what if this leads to a Rollins-Buddy Murphy match at WrestleMania? Obviously, I don't think it will. I'd be shocked. Unless Rollins gets heavy input into his, um, you know, WrestleMania matches, which I'm sure he gets some input, but I'm sure he's not the one saying, oh, I want Buddy Murphy at WrestleMania. Hey, maybe that is the case, and I'm proven wrong, and I would love to be wrong in that case. But I think it's more likely we get Rollins and... Honestly, I don't even really know. I guess they could drag out the Owens and Rollins thing to Mania, but yeah, I'm not really sure, so we'll see. But um, yeah, no, I love the idea of Murphy with Rollins and AOP. It puts him in a prominent spot on the show. And as long as they don't, you know, rush it or have it Rollins and AOP turn on him like next week, then I love it. Um, you know, I think they're setting up some sort of multi man tag team match with. You know, the three baby faces and Rey Mysterio, which, you know, Rey Mysterio was involved in the feud for a little while before he kind of sidetracked and started the feud with Andrade over the United States Championship. So I would assume not next week because Mysterio is in a ladder match. Then maybe the go-home show for the Rumble will get that four-on-four tag team match um, between Big Show, Kevin Owens, Samoa Joe, and Rey Mysterio versus Rollins, AOP, and Buddy Murphy. Um, and again, if Buddy Murphy can come out of this an even bigger star than he was before, which I feel like he will, um, then I'm a big fan of it. Again, if it's only temporary, I'm not a fan. But if they can break off Buddy as a breakout babyface out of this stable down the road, not anytime soon, he can really benefit big time from that. Um, next question comes from uh, BASMRMSW from Twitter. Um, their question was, who are your top three people to win the Royal Rumble? Um, that's a good question. At one point, I was considering Drew McIntyre to be a dark horse, but I don't really think he even is at this point. Um, I don't know if he can be, just because I think there's a lot of people... You know, there's a difference between people saying, oh, I want McIntyre to win the Rumble, and then I think McIntyre will win the Royal Rumble. I want fucking, you know, CM Punk to come back and win the Rumble. That doesn't mean it's going to happen, you know? Um, I, I think he's kind of escaped dark horse territory, though. I think McIntyre might be a legit contender to win it, so... I'm going to say McIntyre, this is going to piss people off, but Cain Velasquez, I don't know if I mentioned this last week, but I've definitely said it somewhere else before where I think Cain Velasquez, there is a very big chance he comes in at number 30 or some shit, takes out Brock, and then wins the whole thing. I have zero interest in Cain and Brock at WrestleMania. Um, The thing is, is that I was as big of a fan as anyone of doing that match, you know, the, the idea of the match a few months ago when Cain first came into the company. The problem was that they rushed it in like two or three weeks for that terrible Crown Jewel pay-per-view, that awful event. The match was no good because it was a two-minute squash. Kane was still hurt. So why would you rush it? Well, like, just do a fucking tag team match or something, you know? You can tease a Brock Kane match, but don't go full on with it and have the guy got beaten two minutes. No, no one cares. Not to say people were clamoring for Kane Velasquez in the, in the first place, but now he feels like a fucking glorified loser. 
Um, and even if he does win the Rumble, I just I, I can't say I care, to be honest with you. I just, I really don't. And I don't care to see Kane and Brock at WrestleMania. If you wanted to do that, they should have held off on bringing Kane in or build to him entering the Rumble and, and getting people to care about him before he was to win the Rumble. Having him come back into nowhere and win the thing over a guy like a Drew McIntyre, people will be fucking pissed at, I guarantee you. Maybe not as mad as they would be if Roman Reigns wins, which is my third person. I think Roman just makes the most sense. I don't want to see him win five years removed from his last Rumble victory. Because I will say this, I've discussed this before with various other people. Roman's booking in 2019 was very good. And you might be saying to yourself, well, he didn't win many important matches. And that's the thing, he didn't. Not to say that he was a loser for most of the year, but he wasn't as unstoppable as he has been in years past, which has kind of added to the appeal of the Roman Reigns character. He's more vulnerable, um, he's more likable, relatable, coming off the cancer thing. So uh, I I think, you know, he was booked very well. He wasn't shoved down people's throats. He was not involved in the world championship picture at all on Raw or SmackDown during his time in 2019. Um, You know, I I think Roman, it's only inevitable. I really, I've said this to a million people, but I can tell you right now, it's going to be Bray Wyatt and Roman Reigns at WrestleMania. I'm not even disappointed that's the direction they're going in because it does make sense. And there's no way they don't do that match because if it's not Roman Reigns, who the hell else goes for that championship at WrestleMania? The answer is nobody. I just can't see anyone else facing the Fiend for the title and realistically beating him. Um, I don't want to see him win the Rumble. I think there's other ways of getting to Roman and Bray at WrestleMania that don't involve Roman winning the Rumble again. So I hope that doesn't happen, but there's a very real chance it does. Um, At Reborn, again, John Ritland from the YouTube machine. Be sure to check out his show. Real Honesty with John Ritland. Great stuff. His first question was, has the return of Liv Morgan already been butchered or can it be salvaged? You know, the thing is, I, I can't say I really had high hopes for Liv Morgan's return anyway. Like, I thought it was stupid they brought her back on SmackDown in the summer and then they teased something where they were like, oh, I'm coming back a changed woman and then we didn't see her for fucking five months after that. Um, I wasn't a fan of that. Utilize the woman, but I'm not a big Liv Morgan fan anyway. I'm really not. I don't see Liv Morgan being the next women's champion. She's not all that good in the ring. I'm not really big of a fan of her character work and shit like that. I'm just not a Liv Morgan fan. So I can't say it's like, for example, that, you know, Shayna Baszler was brought in to do this fucking lesbian storyline with Lana. Like, that would be very disappointing. That would have been she's she's fucking done for at this point. With Liv... I can't really say I care too much. I hate the feud. I hate the storyline with Rusev and Lashley and Lana now live. It's fucking terrible. Don't get me wrong, but it's not that I'm disappointed about Liv's return, Liv's return. I guess it could have been bigger. It could have been something more important, but I never really saw her as being a top tier talent in that division anyway. So has it been butchered? I mean, I guess, but she's, hey, you know what? She's more relevant now than she has been at any other point in her entire WWE career. And that includes NXT. Day. As bad as this angle is, it's definitely a step down for someone like a Bobby Lashley and to an extent Rusev too, who could be doing far better than this shit. But for Liv Morgan, when was the last time she was even relevant? The Riot Squad were booked like losers for the year and a half they were around on the main roster. She was a loser in NXT because she's not that good. Um, She deserves better, but she was never that good to begin with. So this puts her in a pretty prominent spot on the show. So, honestly, I can't even say that it was butchered because they're doing more with her now than they have at any other point in her main roster career. So, is it really that bad? I mean, the storyline sucks, yeah, but in terms of her positioning on the show, she's been on the show now two or three weeks in a row, and she's a pretty, you know, not that people are clamoring for more Liv Morgan, but, you know, honestly, it's, it's, for her sake, long term may not be the best deal. Um, It's not going to have her be taken seriously at all, of course, but... Compared to what she was doing before, it's honestly, it's an improvement. I hate to say it, but it is. Um, John's second question here. Can this new wisecracking Drew McIntyre work long term? If so, what do you think his ceiling is in WWE? Um, the whole wisecracking thing, I think, is just their way maybe of turning a babyface. I know the Durbinator asked about this last week, um, about whether they're about to pull the trigger on a babyface run for Drew McIntyre, which they absolutely should. I wrote a whole article for Daily DDT back in September about how they should have fucking brought him back as a baby face. They didn't, but they should have. Um, but yeah, no, I think they're doing that. I don't like the corny shit. I mean, it's not bad yet, but I do fear if they continue to do it, it'll just they'll just run it into the ground. They'll take something good and just ruin it. And uh, I, I think it's their way of endearing him to the audience. 
while still being a badass, because he came across like a heel in that triple threat and before the match in that promo segment, so I'm not exactly sure what they're doing yet with Drew McIntyre, but um, so far, honestly, it's working. So far, it is working. Long term, I'm not sure. I like babyface, straightforward, badass Drew McIntyre. That's what I want to see. Not so much the wisecracking, maybe sometimes, but long term, I want the Drew McIntyre that we had in that X day just with the aggression that we've had so far in the main roster. Kind of merge those two personas, and you have, a, you have a real superstar in your hands right there. His third question, could you see more talents refusing to go to Saudi Arabia shows going forward, or will they be forced to cave in to company pressure? I could definitely see more people saying, hey, I don't, I don't want to go there. I mean, I can't even say like, oh, if it was going to happen, it would happen by now, because I guess, I, I didn't read the report, but I saw people tweeting about it that Roman Reigns, Roman Reigns, I guess, doesn't want to go to the next Saudi show, which is reportedly set for next month, which, you know, I knew there had to be something when they, when they canceled the Fastlane pay-per-view, I'm like, there's got to be a reason for this, it's too good to be true to just have Elimination Chamber on the road to WrestleMania, honestly, ideally, I would have no pay-per-views between Rumble and Mania, but I know that's not realistic for their pay-per-view schedule, it's because we're having two shows, we're having the fucking Chamber show in March, not February, and they're having the Saudi show in late February, which I guess it was supposed to happen the, the 20th, and they bumped it back to the 27th. Who gives a fuck at this point? Honestly, who cares? Um, the whole thing is just stupid. I don't give a shit about the shows. They're notoriously terrible. Everyone they've done so far has been terrible. Um, I Honestly, I do hope more people say, hey, I'm not going, because then it takes out all their big players. Kevin Owens doesn't want to go. Daniel Bryan doesn't want to go. Apparently, Roman doesn't want to go. John Cena doesn't want to go. Alistair Black can't go. Sami Zayn can't go. That, that's that's a lot of top talent right there. So at some point, they're going to reach a point where no one's going to want to go. After the bullshit that transpired the last time with the travel nonsense and whatever else, which was fucking dumb. Um, and I think the 27th of February, let me look right now on my calendar. Yeah, it's a Thursday. Why the fuck would you put yourself in a similar situation that you did a couple months ago by having a show take place the day before SmackDown. That's stupid. Because did they get in a similar situation the last time where, um, you know, where it, it, the plane can't take off and they're delayed? They're left without another SmackDown. So just have it be a Raw pay-per-view or something. I don't know. Don't put the SmackDown talent on the show if you don't have to. I can't believe they're doing this again. It's unbelievable to me, and honestly, I, I honestly cannot believe it. It's really stupid to do the shows back-to-back after the issues they ran into last time. Um, but anyway, so with the with the Saudi shit, I hope more people speak up and say, hey, I'm not going, because this is bullshit. I don't want to go there. It's dangerous. I don't want to, blah, blah, blah. And then they can't be fired for it because so many other people have you know, said no, and they're still employed. So I, I, I don't understand why a guy like a Buddy Murphy or a Cedric or whatever can't say, hey, I don't want to go and then be punished for it. You know, that wouldn't really make much sense. Uh, John's next question here. I know you've been to an AEW show recently, so I need to ask, do you think it would be worth going to if it was in my area sometime this year? Absolutely. Absolutely. I thought I had a really fun time. I went to two AEW shows um, last year. I went to Double or Nothing with RJ, which was great, the, a pay-per-view. And then we went to Dynamite in Boston in October, the second ever episode of Dynamite, which is pretty cool that I could say I was there for that, but, um, yeah, no, I would definitely recommend it, it's a, it's a great atmosphere, um, the crowds are always very energetic, I mean, I thought last week's show sucked, to be honest with you, by recent Dynamite standards, I thought that show was terrible, um, I'm, I'm hoping tonight's show is better, the Bash at the Beach episode, but, um, yeah, I, being there for it is an entirely different experience, if you've, it's honestly, I, I like Raw, I like the WWE shows, um, especially in XT, but the Dynamite shows are just a totally different environment where they're always energetic. Regardless of whether you like the shows themselves or not, being there is always fun. So I would definitely recommend going if it's in your area at some point. Um, it would definitely be a blast, and I think you would really enjoy yourself. So definitely go to Dynamite. You know, to say you were there for the first year of the Dynamite shows, that, that's a part of history. You're a part of history right there. So it's a pretty cool thing to be able to claim. Um, let's see, at noob underscore n underscore co 1991, their first question was, um, what did you think of the contract signing segment between Becky Lynch and Asuka? Do you think Becky's chances on retaining the Raw Women's Championship are slim? No, absolutely not. Um, I know she hasn't had a great track record in storyline against Asuka, but Becky's retaining, there's no doubt about it. I, I wrote all about this in an article yesterday for Bleacher Report. 
<clears throat> excuse me, about how, you know, it, it would be cool to see Asuka with the championship. Um, and, you know, hell, in a perfect world, you could do Kyrie Sane and Asuka at WrestleMania. You, you know damn well that Becky, after the year that she's had of dominating the, the women's championship scene on Raw, that she's not, you know, it, it, for her to not go to WrestleMania is ridiculous as the Raw women's champion. They've come this far. They might as well go all the way with it. So I don't think there's any real chance of Asuka losing, or rather of Becky losing, of Asuka winning. Um, and the segment itself I liked. I've actually really enjoyed the feud. They've uh, done going into the Royal Rumble, playing off their history. The Japanese rambling from Asuka, I really don't mind because she's a heel, so it doesn't matter anyway. Uh, Becky's come across well. I like that Asuka got the last laugh, so to speak. She got the last word in on, on, on Monday's Raw by spewing the green mist on uh, Becky Lynch's face, so I thought that was great. But uh, no, I like the segment. I've enjoyed the feed, the match, and the rumble a lot like last year's. Should be killer. Um, at Devarius Willie 2, um, his question was, do you think Ronda Rousey will return? At some point I do, but I said this maybe a week or so ago um, about Ronda Rousey. I really don't think she's coming back at the Rumble. I don't think she's coming back in time for WrestleMania. I don't think she's coming back at all this year. I think she will be back at some point. I don't think she'll be back in 2020. I really don't. Uh, people thought she would have been back you know, before the end of 2019, and she wasn't. So I, I find it hard to believe, like I've said a million times before, that she would leave to start a family. She can't or she whatever. She just isn't in the right frame of mind, and then she would come right back to wrestling. I don't see that happening. Um, I guess it's possible. It's very possible. I don't know the woman personally. But if she wants to have a family, she seemed pretty adamant about it on Total Divas and other places. She is going to have a family. Even if she's not pregnant yet, she will be at some point. Um, I, I just don't see that happening. So, no, I don't see, I don't think she's coming back this year at the Rumble. What, I mean, it'd be awesome if she was. I would love to be proven wrong. Just my gut feeling says she will not be back before the end of 2020. Maybe in time for WrestleMania 37, but definitely not this year, in my opinion. That time bomb zone's got a couple questions here. First one being, with Marty Skrull as one of the top head bookers of Ring of Honor, do you think he could turn Ring of Honor around? I mean, that's the hope. That's the hope. Um, that report came out a couple days ago. And yeah, I'm honestly disappointed. I wanted to see him honestly anywhere else but Ring of Honor. But can he help the company? Can he turn them around fully? No. I mean, Ring of Honor will never be what it once was. When the Elite was there and even before that, they will never be what they once were. Like, that, it's, it's almost ridiculous to even suggest that. But can they be in a better spot than they're in right now? Absolutely. The company's had no buzz for a long time. Their pay-per-views have not just been that good. The shows haven't been that good. It's, until this past weekend, I thought they took a step in the right direction um, with Saturday's Saturday Night at Center Stage show and then Sunday's Honor Reign Supreme show. Um, I thought they did a really good job with both shows. Marty got pinned on both shows, which is interesting if he's the new head booker that he would just willingly have himself pinned, but I guess he's you know that generous. I hit my calendar by accident. That's what that noise was. But anyway... Um, no, I think he can help Ring of Honor a lot as the booker because if those shows were of his doing, and I also read that the free show they're doing in Baltimore next month was also of his doing, then that's a good sign because both shows were really good. Um, I don't know you know, what talent they plan to bring in and shit like that. I think at this point for Ring of Honor, I think it's a lot less about bringing in people and more about keeping who they have because they've managed to keep Marty. It looks like they're holding on to... You know, they re-signed Matt Taven. I don't, that's not a game changer, but they re-signed him a couple months ago. They hold on to Shane Taylor. Um, I, I would think that's not official, but I think they have. They think they have. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think he could do Ring of Honor, a world of good as their top booker. For me personally, I'm just disappointed because selfishly, I wanted to see him really anywhere but Ring of Honor. AEW would make the most sense to see him there either reunited with the Elite or to you know, feud with them, whatever, it just, it would have made too much sense, and then you have NXT is also a possibility, which I didn't think was going to happen anyway, but he'd be cool there, New Japan, um, he's still working with NWA, which is cool, but Ring of Honor just has no buzz, maybe he can help with that, but even Impact, like, they're on a spot now where they had uh, Don Callis and Scott Demore take over about two years ago, and they've done Impact a lot of good, they've had far better shows than Ring of Honor has in the last year or two, I would say, ever since the Elite left anyway, and they still have no buzz, they moved to a new network, Access TV, got them a bit more momentum, but people still are not talking about Impact as much as they should, I know Tessa just won the world title, I'll talk about that later, 
Um, people are talking about that now for the wrong reasons, but still, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, they've had a lot of good shows. They still have very little buzz. Ring of Honor, even if they turn things around, it's, it's a dead brand at this point. Marty, I think, he's wasting any shred of momentum he had left from his elite days by sticking with Ring of Honor. Now is the time to be a hot free agent. I don't think, honestly, if he becomes a free agent even in a year or two, he's going to have the same type of fanfare that he does right now. I think he missed his window. Um, I'm not the guy, you know, he's probably getting paid a lot of money, so who am I to say what is smart for him to do business-wise? But I really do think he should have gone anywhere else but there because career-wise, it's just the dead fucking end. If they didn't put the world championship on him before, maybe they will now. But it's like they didn't strike while the iron is hot. And that's every bit of his problem as it is Ring of Honors. Because Marty was the one at the end of the day that chose to stay there. And now, you know, the company, not that it's going to go under, but, you know, they, if they have no buzz and he, and he figures he can't change the place like he hopes to, then that's his own fault. Um, at Time Bomb Zone, second question here. If Okada went to WWE, would he be used like another Nakamura on the main roster? I don't know if it would be quite as bad as Nakamura, but I, I have no faith. Zero faith they would use Okada like the star that he is. It's not like Kenny Omega, who is treated like a god over in Japan, and if he came over, that he would have been just another mid-card guy in the main roster. I don't believe that for a second. I really do think they would have given him the aggressive push that he would have been deserving of, um, and, it, and it would have turned into something really cool, I think. I mean, that maybe they would have botched him. Who knows? We'll never really know for sure because he's with uh, AEW now. But with Okada, though, it's a different story because he doesn't speak much English. He doesn't have the same mic skills that, that Omega does. doesn't have the same appeal that Omega does to American viewers. I mean, he could because uh, he's a fucking god over in Japan, too, as he should be because he's one of the greatest of all time. I just, I don't, I mean, WWE has a very sketchy track record when it comes to how they book Japanese talent, really how they book any talent specifically. It's not a Japanese thing, but like they have yet to have one truly successful Japanese star. Nakamura is probably the best of the bunch, to be honest with you. Um, he's won a lot of titles, multiple Intercontinental United States Championships, won the Royal Rumble, two-time NXT champion. Um, he's done very well for himself, but at the end of the day, he's not the top guy that he should have been upon coming to the main roster. Okada probably sees that. I mean, he realized this well before Nakamura you know, had done to him what he had done with the main roster booking and whatnot. He sees how things work there, and he's like, nah, fam, I'm not, why would I go through that? Why would I relocate, you know, leave this place where I'm making a ton of money and beloved, having great matches? That makes no sense for anyone involved. It doesn't make any sense for WWE. They have enough talent as it is. It doesn't make sense for Okada. It doesn't make sense for New Japan to let him go. They'd be fucked. If they didn't have Okada and, and Tanahashi, oh, New Japan would definitely be fucked. Um, but I don't ever see that happening. Okada already had his bad stint in TNA, and he doesn't have, uh, hold as much of a grudge against Impact as the bookers of New Japan do. Okada even said that he's thankful for his time in TNA for some of the things that some of the things that his tenure there taught him. But even still, they treated him like a loser. I know WWE is a different beast, but they're not much better. So I, I, I don't think it would end well. And I'm glad he's staying right where he is. I mean, it would be cool just to see him in a WWE ring for maybe 20 minutes before we, you know, before it starts to set in, like, holy shit, um, you know, this guy's in WWE, he, he's fucked, because they're going to ruin this guy. He's not going to ever be the same that he would have been in New Japan. His next question here, what wrestlers from NXT UK would you like to see go to NXT? Um, a bunch of different people. First of all, the NXT brand itself is, is great. If you're not already watching, it definitely do so. Um, the show every Wednesday is not musty by any means, but it's it's definitely still pretty good. And it, you should be watching it if you want to check out the takeovers, which you absolutely should be watching, because those are some of the best shows you'll see all year. But uh, by the way, my, my fucking voice is still killing me, by the way. So if you're just tuning in now, if you skipped ahead or something, it's because I'm, I, I, my cough came back last night for whatever reason. I don't know why. And uh, my voice is completely shot, so I apologize. But anyway, wrestlers from NXT UK that I would like to see in NXT. Um, Tony Storm is a given. I think she's the first one to uh, move on over. I mean, obviously, the first people are like Pete Dunne and Rhea Ripley. But in terms of like first people right now to move over to NXT UK, from NXT UK to NXT, would be Tony Storm. She was on the show last week. She failed to regain the NXT UK Women's Championship on Sunday. There's not much else for her to do in NXT UK. Um, she'd be a great addition when already stacked 
NXT uh, women's division. So uh, Tony Storm, first and foremost. And then I would throw in a couple other people. Grizzled Young Vets. If you're not already familiar with them, you should be. They're very good. I was not the biggest fan of Zach Gibson when I first saw him in the WWE UK title tourney two years ago. Um, he had great heat, more heat than anyone else. I didn't really get the character, and the guy was good. But he kind of felt bland to me. But this tag team with James Drake has been the best thing to happen to the guy. I guess they were already teaming before WWE um, in progress and places like that. But they're really, really good together. And uh, they had a great reign as NXT UK Tag Team Champions. They have great matches. Just watch tonight. I'm sure if, if the uh, Grizzled Young Vets versus Time Splitters match doesn't steal the show, then I'm a, I'm a fucking idiot because that should be a great match. Um, they've already won the tag titles. They feel to regain them a lot like Tony Storm did on Sunday. Um, so I think they would be another likely addition to NXT's tag team division. I think NXT needs more needs them more than NXT UK does because NXT is really fucking scraping the bottom of the barrel for tag teams right now. So I feel like Gibson and and Drake going to NXT would be a great would be a great move. Um, Tyler Bate is another obvious one. I feel like he you know already won the WWE United Kingdom title. Um, he had that awesome main event with with Walter. Black and uh, back in Blackpool, excuse me. I thought he would be moving to the main roster for NXT. That is right after that takeover in August, but obviously he stuck around. He had some feuds with Noam Dar, and then recently Jordan Devlin, which was amazing. Um, but he's kind of done it all in NXT UK. Again, he's feuded with pretty much everybody. Beat Devlin, did the tag team thing. Hasn't won the tag team titles yet with Trend Seven, but if they didn't do it initially, I don't think they ever will. I mean, I guess they could, but. Aside from that, there's really not much more for him to do, and uh, he would be really cool to see in NXT because he's a fucking star. Um, and then there's Jordan Devlin. I think Jordan Devlin is a fantastic talent. The guy is so fucking good. He's one of those people that I had no idea who he was when I first saw him in NXT UK. He was in the first two title tourneys a few years ago. He did nothing for me. Then he felt like a Finn Balor light, um, but then they really started to push him. And he's really, I've become a big fan of his on NXT UK. Um, he hasn't really had much success in NXT UK. He hasn't won many big matches. He, I think he owns victories over or Bomber, Dave Mastiff, and Travis Banks. But he's already failed to beat Walter. And he's already failed to beat um, all these other people. People like Tyler Bate and Pete Dunne and whatever. So, um, again, NXT has a stacked roster too. So, they would have to be able to do something with him before they could bring him over. But at some point, Devil in NXT would be really cool because the guy is very, very talented. At RJ underscore Marceau, Mr. Marceau's question from Twitter was, um, where would NXT UK take over Blackpool to rank against the other NXT UK takeovers? It was a great show. Um, where would it rank against the other takeovers? God, that's it's tough. I think the, I think the first Cardiff one is still my favorite. Um, just because I thought that was a better card overall. Although this card on Sunday was still great too. It's so hard to say. Um, I really liked that first show because that that tag team title match was great. Um, Tony Storm and Ripley was great. They had, I think, Mastiff and Eddie Dennis was a good match. They had Joe Coffey and Pete Dunne in a very good main event. And then they had Walter Davey, which was a great ending. It's so hard to say which one was better. I don't know. I'm very partial to that Cardiff one because that main event was like one of the best matches I saw all year and the tag team title change was great and then the women's title change was great um I'm trying to think what else they had on that show back in uh fucking back in Cardiff I don't remember they had the three title matches but I don't remember what else they had um oh Cesaro and Ilya Dragunov was a great match so yeah they, they had a, they had a lot of very good matches on that show um, so it's hard to say, I don't know, I'm very partial to that one, this might have even been the weakest, just because the main event wasn't as good as the other two main events, I thought, I thought Pete Dunne and Joe Coffey, and then Walter and, and Bate was better than this one, um, was better than Joe Coffey versus Walter, but still, um, I thought it was, it was a good main event, and the other matches were just fucking killer, so honestly, it's hard to say, this might have been the weakest one yet, but even that is saying a lot, because that Jordan Devlin, Tyler Bate match, we Woo Lad. Woo Lad is all I got to say about that. That was a great match. And the rest of the card was great, too. The tag team title ladder match was great. The women's match was great. Eddie Dennis and Trent Seven was good. Uh, the main event was good. Um, well, I can't remember the other match now. What was the other match? Eddie Dennis. Uh, Dave Mastiff. Was he on the show? 
What was the other fucking match? Tyler Bate, Devlin, Eddie Dennis, Trent Seven, the women's tag team in the main event. Oh, it was only those five matches, so. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a very good show. Very, very good show. If you haven't already checked it out, definitely do so. But before that, you should check out this. So RJ's next question, how great was the NXT UK Blackpool Prime Target? God, it was so good. I recommended it to RJ last week after the takeover ended. And he watched it yesterday and he texted me. He said, wow, that thing was sick. Dude, it was so good. It's so good. First of all, WWE's production department is second to none. Second of all, they're just fucking, I mean, they, they really, like, I thought that might have been better. That might have even been better than the takeover itself. And again, that's saying something because it was a great show. That prime target got me so excited for that takeover. The prime targets in general are very good. If you, I, I've already reviewed them here on the channel before. I, I reviewed that one um, here on the channel a couple days ago, I think on Friday or something, either Friday or Saturday or whatever. Um, but yeah, check it out. Check out the other ones they've done for Ripley and Baszler. They did one for Gargano and Cole. They did one for, um, actually the takeover Cardiff one back in August. They did one as well. So yeah, they, they, they do a very good job of that shit. Definitely check it out. If you haven't seen the takeover Blackpool 2 show yet, check out the prime target before it. It's only about 40 minutes. Well worth the time, though. Very much worth the time. I showed it to Alexis. So I watched it Friday during the day, and then I reviewed it. And it was so good that I watched it again with Alexis after SmackDown last week. And even she was like, holy shit, that was great. That was really good. She had chills, too, by the end of it. Um, great shit there. Especially if you're not familiar with the NXT UK storylines and the talent. Watch that first, and then watch TakeOver. And then you'll be like, wow, I'm, what, am I, what have I been missing out on this entire time? Which is why I don't really understand the criticisms like, oh, you know, fucking WWE with their NXT UK brand, they're ruining the, uh, N- they're ruining the UK scene, blah, blah, blah. Get the fuck over it. Their shows are very good. Um, it may not be your progress or your cherished fucking whatever else, but who gives a shit? Like, hey, maybe WWE did help kill the UK scene by signing up all the talent. I'm not denying that, but I'm just saying, to say the show's like, oh, it's a, it's a shell of what it should be, or it's boring. Like, go fuck off, because these takeovers have been consistently some of the best they've ever done. Uh, shows, like, period. Just, some of the best shows of the year, period. So, um, you know, it was a very good show. Definitely check it out if you haven't already. At Iwagu91, I got to wrap up here because my fucking voice is killing me, but I know we have a bunch of questions to go. At Iwagu91's first question was, your thoughts on Tessa Blanchard becoming Impact World Champion? Um, so to kind of combine this with the other question from at Scarlet One, who asked about uh, thoughts on the recent controversy surrounding Tessa Blanchard and what lasting effect it might have on her and Impact, I'll just sum this up all together here. It's a very bad situation. I'm a Tessa Blanchard fan. Um, I thought, you know, I, 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 I said this before that I didn't really think the tweets and shit, not the tweet, but like all the backlash that came out over the weekend would change the outcome of that match. And it didn't, she still went over as the new world champion, um, as she should have. I mean, in terms of storytelling, it just made, it just made the most sense for her to win. She's a hot actor right now, despite the fact that people fucking hate her for what happened. And rightfully so. I mean, it's pretty disgusting what happened. And it's not like a matter of he said, she said. There's a lot of accounts from a lot of different people about what she said to, um, I forgot the name of the woman who was uh, the victim in all this. Something, uh, I, I don't remember. Blanca Negro or something like that her name was. Uh, I can't remember. But anyway, so she was, um, I guess, bullied by Tessa in Japan a couple years ago. And Tessa spit in her face and called her the N-word. Fucking disgusting, if true. Which, it honestly sounds like it is, because not, that's not something you just make up. Um, uh, Allison K accused her of that. The person, the victim involved, um, you know, had a lot to say about it, too. Um, Isla Dawn, Chelsea Green, there's a lot of people that will not deny that it happened, that were there, and they saw it, and whatever. So, I'm sure it is true. People change, and, you know, that's great. And this is only three years ago, though. Um, it should have never happened in the first place. That's fucking gross. And honestly, if I'm Tessa Blanchard, she should fucking apologize. She's got to clear the air. Just to tweet out, oh, that's not true, is bullshit. Because there's so many reports coming out now that it has to be true. It's like the whole fucking Harvey Weinstein shit. You can't say it's not true when there's so many women coming out about it. And it's very hard to believe they're all in cahoots to bury Tessa Blanchard. That's very unrealistic, so. Very unlikely, I should say. 
Um, so I, it's just a bad situation. So I, I don't disagree with Impact and their decision to put the title on her because just from a storyline standpoint, it made the most sense. And they weren't going to not do it because of this whole thing that might blow over, which I don't think it will. Um, it's not going to be as bad in a week from now. But people will not be talking about it as much as they did over the weekend. So I'm, I'm glad they put the title on her. I think it's still a very big moment for women's wrestling. I know Sexy Star did it in Lucha. People bring that up all the time. First of all, she sucked. Second of all, it made no sense. And third of all, it felt forced and it just it lasted like a week. So that doesn't really do anything. And plus, Lucha was on a fucking unknown network, El Rey network, and it wasn't as big as Impact is. So that's not really a fair comparison. Um, I'm not denying that it happened, the whole you know sexy star thing, but and it did. She made history, but it that was just no one was a fan of that at the time. The Tessa thing is a different story, and people are comparing Tessa to sexy star because she too is a piece of shit for what happened with Rosemary a couple of years ago at a Mex- at a Triple A show or something like that. So if I'm Tessa and all these all the shit is coming out, just to ignore it is not a good look. If it's one person, whatever, but like. There's so many people coming out about it. She has to issue an apology or just own up to it or share your side of the story and still apologize anyway because it had to have happened. I mean, I wasn't there, so I can't say for 100% certainty, but this is a little more than, again, like I said, the he said, she said. So it's a very bad situation. I'm still a Tessa fan. I'm not going to be one of those people that says, oh, fuck her. You know, she seemed like a very negative person for a while there, and then she has since turned herself around an impact, which is great. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of bringing things up from the past and, and whatever. If it happened in the past, not to say keep it in the past and ignore it, it ever happened, because it, you know, it, her conse- she never dealt with the consequences. Um, it's not like, you know, she was arrested and, you know, she dealt with the consequences and whatever. Like that shit leaving in the past, who cares? But like this shit was never dealt with. And the woman that was the victim of it is still dealing with it constantly. So much so that she told all these other people because she was very you know, nervous about the whole thing and obviously understandably so. So Tessa should absolutely be fucking raked over the coals for this shit for what happened, if true, which it sounds like it is. Um, not that Impact should strip the world championship from her if it happened three years ago. It's not like Del Rio when he was talking about WWE as the world champion and he got involved in all this domestic abuse incidents, uh, all this, all these issues with Paige that was happening while he was the world champion. Um, again, it's, it's still disgusting, but if she just apologizes and moves on, it would be a little bit more bearable, but she has yet to do so. So that, that's the first step. Do you think that Shelton Benjamin could have become a main event talent in the WWE? Um, a lot of people say that. I just don't think so. I really don't. I think he could have been higher up on the totem pole than he was, but the fact of the matter is, his mic skills sucked. He was never a great talker. Shelton always had a problem with his promos. Um, he was a great athlete. You know, he came close to becoming champion, not the world champion, but like he went for the belt a few times in like 04, 05, but they were never going to push him to that next level just because he was just not befitting of a main event talent. You know, he was kind of like the Kofi Kingston of 10 years ago, where 15 years ago even where he was a great athlete, but never people never really looked at him as a world champion. Kofi's different because he has more charisma than Shelton, and he can talk better than Shelton, and it was just a better story. With Shelton, I mean, the guy's a great athlete, but, like, even Alexis now, I mean, granted, she hasn't seen his old work, but, like, even she's not a big Shelton fan because she could not care less. She's been given no reason to care about him, but at the same time, nothing really stands out about as special about being... Anything, nothing really stands out as special about Shelton Benjamin, um, as much as it, you know, he used to 10, 15 years ago, when the roster didn't have as many good wrestlers as he was, the issue now is that there's so many good wrestlers, is that Shelton is just another guy, so if he doesn't have a set gimmick, and if he doesn't, you know, um, have anything else that makes him stand apart from everyone else, then he's just going to fade into the background the same way that he has for the last two or three years, so uh, yeah, with Shelton, and I'm not surprised that they haven't really done much with him. They should be doing more. I'm not arguing that. Um, they just completely wasted the guy since he came back to the company. But to say he he should have been a world champion at some point, I just I don't think so. I really don't. Um, I've heard various stories that he came close. I think Kurt Hawkins may have talked about this in one of those fucking RF shoot videos or timeline things or whatever from 2008 where he was asked about why Shelton never really got that next big push as the world champion, I think it was an attitude thing, 
I don't know. I, I think there's a little more to it than that. I mean, the guy just was never really... I never really looked at Shelton thinking he was a future world champion because his mic skills were never great. Um, I mean, I, I, I think John Morrison... John Morrison's mic skills aren't great either, but at least he has the charisma. Benjamin never really had that charisma, in my opinion. That's that's kind of what prevented him from reaching the next level. At Scarlet One uh, from Twitter, we'll wrap up with their questions here. Uh, best and worst of uh, the Wednesday Night Wars, number 13. Iwagu91 I, also asked about the Buddy Murphy, Rollins, AOP thing, but I already talked about that earlier. So Scarlet's question about the best and worst of the Wednesday Night Wars, number 13 from last week. Um, the best, the main event of NXT was very good between Keith Lee, Dominic Dijakovic, Damian Priest, Cameron Grimes. Great fatal four-way. The promo exchange between Johnny Gargano and Finn Balor I thought was also really, really good. Setting stage or setting the stage for their NXT TakeOver Portland match coming up next month, which I think has actually been set in stone as of like today's bump or something. Today's episode of WWE's The Bump, their, their big breaking news show on uh, the YouTube channel, but... Anyway, so uh, yeah, Gargano and Balor, I thought their promo exchange, their verbal exchange was very good in NXT. The six-woman tag team match was also good with uh, Tony Storm, Maria Ripley, and Candice versus Kaylee Ray, Io Shirai, and Bianca Belair to kick off the show. I actually really enjoyed the Imperium Forgotten Sons match. I thought that was really good. Um, even better than, which I thought was not, not the worst, but the weakest of NXT was Undisputed Air versus Gallus. I was kind of bored by that match. I'm not a big, big Gallus guy. I love Undisputed Air, but the match was kind of just there for me. Um, I honestly thought Imperium versus Forgotten Sons was better. I thought that was a great sprint from both teams. Forgotten Sons had their best showing in God knows how long. And Imperium's always very good, so I really enjoyed that match. From Dynamite, I liked the Moxley Inner Circle segment where he said he would join them. I mean, it was obvious what the outcome would be, but I thought it was well done. The people liked it. I liked Moxley. I liked Jericho. I liked their dynamics. So I thought that was good. And then the opener between Private Party and um, Adam Page and Kenny Omega, I thought that was a great opener. You know, I I don't like Private Party not being buried, but like they picked up that big win over the Young Bucks two, three months ago at Dynamite when I was there. They have not felt special since then. Um, It feels like they've lost far more than they've won. They're not really on the show all that much. Um, And when they are, they're not winning many important matches. So I thought this was weird. Like when they beat Santana and Ortiz, they were the first team to beat Santana and Ortiz who have also not really gone on to do much recently. So the, the booking of all these teams is bizarre to me. The weakest of each show, um, first from NXT, like I said, Undisputed Air versus Gallus was the only match I didn't really care too, care too much for. Even Mia Yim versus, um, what's her name, Caden Carter, I didn't really mind just because it set up the debut of uh, Chelsea Green and Robert Stone as a pairing, as an on-air pairing. From Dynamite was easily their weakest worst show to date. Like it's not even close for Dynamite. It was just it was not a good show. Outside of the opener, I just did not like the show. The DDP segment sucked. Um Rio and Chris Statlander sucked. The booking there with like DDP getting back in the ring was stupid. Um I have no desire to see that tonight, which is why I'm watching NXT first. So I'm not a big fan of that. Um so yeah, I'm, I, that that's gonna be happening. Tonight, I guess, don't care about that. MJF was the saving grace of that segment. Other than that, I just thought it sucked. Rio and Statlander was bogged down by all the interference and the Nightmare Collective. Who gives a fuck? Um, even the Rhodes Brothers versus Lucha Bros. That was a fun match, but way too many Canadian destroyers and kickouts and this and that and cutters and super kicks. God, it's a fucking indie spot fest. And it doesn't make any sense. Cody's feuding with, um, with MJF. Excuse me, Dustin Rhodes is feeding with Jake Hager, and Pentagon's feeding with Christopher Daniels. So what the fuck was the point of this match? And why have the Rhodes bros go over when they're not a regular tag team? I just, I was very confused by all this booking. Um, This was not a great match at all, I didn't think, to be honest with you. Um, I mean, it was a good match, it was very well wrestled, but the booking of it just made absolutely no sense. So the entire episode was very weak. Hopefully they can bounce back tonight, but yeah, Dynamite was easily their weakest showing last Wednesday. Their second question here, thoughts on the recent controversy with Tessa Blanchard. I already talked about that earlier. Their next question, have you heard about the other controversies surrounding Gabe Sapolsky, the owner of Evolve, paying wrestlers little to no money? Yeah, this has been in the news now for a while. I'm not really sure if it caught fire the same way previously that it has now. Um, but it's it's been a big story involving him and David Starr, who I guess is a pretty prominent indie wrestler. I'm not too, too familiar with him, but I'm, I'm familiar with him enough to know who he is, but he was claiming that Gabe Sapolsky, which other wrestlers have backed up, this has probably caught steam again, because Darby Allen was on the Talk is Jericho podcast last Friday, 
with Jericho, and I was listening to it, and Darby Allen was not kind about his uh, time in Evolve, about how, you know, he was getting paid shit and money, and because he's not really that big of a name compared to the other people they would bring in, they, would, they wouldn't fly him in. He had to live in Florida, and they were just doing dumb booking decisions with him. It was ridiculous. They, you know, they were having, not, like, in terms of, when I say dumb booking, I'm saying, like, they weren't really flying him out anywhere because he would live elsewhere and then he would have to live out of his fucking car in the area and they wouldn't use him and do all this dumb stuff for the show, like putting his body on the line. It's been not getting really paid all that much. It was a whole fucking mess. Um, so then David Starr jumped on that saying that, you know, Gabe doesn't really pay his wrestlers and they kind of pay them out of like, oh, you're facing this WWE talent tonight. That should be enough exposure for you as opposed to, as opposed to us paying you the money that you deserve. A few other people jumped on this too. Gabe, you know, flipped out about it on Twitter. He's like, that's bullshit. I pay my wrestlers. And then he agreed to pay his wrestlers and he deleted his tweets. The whole thing was a mess. I don't really care about David Starr, like, making a t-shirt out of it. I think that whole thing is kind of dumb. I'm not really sure why he cares so much because, he. I mean, I'm sure he's worked there before, but he's kind of going out of his way to bury Evolve. But it's not a good process. I mean, he's not wrong either. So both people are kind of at fault here. Uh, chasing attention for no reason. David Starr feels like he's trying to be relevant for the sake of being relevant. And then when he can kind of handle this stuff in private, and then Gabe Sapolsky just should absolutely be paying his talent. Like, that's that's inexcusable. Um, so the whole thing was just a fucking mess. Another controversy, their next question goes, that now goes hand-in-hand hand with the Evolve thing. Did you hear about when Triple H addressed NXT UK's effect on the British indie scene by stating that the dying promotions were only the shady ones and that WWE supported the healthy ones. I did not see that, actually. I saw every other controversy that you're about to talk about here, including the Gabe Sapolsky one and the Tessa Blanchard one. I did not hear about Triple H's comments about that. I heard about the Page thing, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, but I did not hear about that, which is so untrue. Um, not that I ever took part in it or that I ever went to a show but what culture used to have their own wrestling promotion that definitely had to close because of NXT UK? Um, I, I wasn't the biggest defiant wrestling fan to begin with, and I write for the website. I, I mean, I probably should be. Um, I never went to any of their shows. I never watched the shows. It just seems strange they were paying out all these big money names, these big notable names to fly out to their shows. That The money had to be coming from somewhere. Um, and then it just died to death after a while, not just because they ran out of money for it, but because... WWE scooped up almost all of their talent. Um, that was a big issue too. And they weren't shady. I mean, I, I write for what culture. I don't, I don't work work there um, to the effect that those other people do, but I don't think they were shady at all. Um, they just kind of died because NXT UK took their talent. So I think that's kind of a dumb thing to say. Is progress a healthy promotion? I mean, even they're not doing as hot as they want they used to be because um, they're not like... I don't know, it felt like they were doing better when they weren't associated with WWE. They have been associated and in bed with WWE since the whole start of the UK title tourney and, and that whole brand three years ago. I was at a Progress show in August of 2017, and Jack Gallagher was there, and Pete Dunne was the United Kingdom champion. Um, you know, they had a, a lot of WWE stars on the show, um, NXT stars, people like that. But um, the issue is that, you know, I don't know, it doesn't really feel as hot as it once was. The entire British scene doesn't feel as hot as it once was. And that's because of WWE. So I, I don't agree with him there. I mean, I could see what he's saying to kind of, you know, defend himself and whatnot. But I, I just don't agree. Um, did you hear about the other, other controversy this week about Triple H's joke regarding Paige? Yeah, I did see that. I heard the video. Um, I could see why people would say, oh, you know, calm down, it's just a joke, it's 2020, people get offended by everything. Let's be fair, though, it was kind of a low blow, it wasn't really necessary, I'm not really sure why he had to go there, it was just a dumb thing to say, you don't have to cancel Triple H for it, whatever the fuck that means, but, um, it was a dumb thing to say, I mean, Paige is an employee of hers, for him to say that was really inappropriate, because it is something she's still dealing with, something she had severe, uh, severe depression over, the whole leaks and everything else, and, Basically, the line was like, oh, um, I don't know what the context was, but he said that Paige might have kids that she doesn't even know about. Um, when they were talking about Paige's retirement and Daniel Bryan coming out of retirement and people like that and whatever else, and Edge, I guess, is what they were referring to. And he said, oh, Paige might have kids out there she's not even aware of. And it was, it was kind of a dumb line. It was really a stupid, awkward line. And you could tell the people that were there only laughed because they were kind of, they kind of felt forced to because Triple H kind of made them laugh because he would have felt like an asshole if they didn't. 
Um, it's just an unnecessary line. Paige didn't, you know, she was obviously hurt by it enough to tweet about it, and then she was interviewed by BT Sport after the fact, where she said, like, yeah, we've talked, and it's, you know, whatever. Um, I guess he reached out, which is all that's important. I mean, I don't care if he's the COO of the company or not, or whatever the fuck his role is. He should outright publicly apologize. Absolutely. I know he doesn't like have he doesn't like to have egg on his face, but he should absolutely apologize for what he said. I'm not saying it was too terrible, the same way that Tessa Blanchard should apologize, but it was still a dumb thing to say. People supported Paige because it was not a nice thing to say. Um, it's not a cancel culture thing or people are too sensitive. It's it wasn't honestly even that funny to begin with. It just kind of came out of nowhere and it just felt stupid. It was one of those old DX lines and it's kind of about a serious topic that Paige takes very seriously. So I thought that was kind of a dumb thing for him to say. Um, and he, he should issue an apology, but he definitely won't. How familiar are you with anime? I'm using Xavier Woods hosting an anime award con- uh, c- ceremony, excuse me, an anime award ceremony as an excuse to ask this. Um, I don't watch anime. I have nothing against anime. I'm one of those people where if like, you don't bother me about it, then I really don't care. Um, I'm straight edge, but I don't care about people who drink like that type of thing, you know, and then I, I try to be that type of person. Um, I, I don't really care about anime. I don't watch anime, but I don't hate anime. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of passionate people that follow it, that are into it, which is awesome. Um, I'm, I'm into a lot of like YouTubers and shit that watch anime. I know people who like anime. That's great. Um, and it's really cool to be, I mean, their anime is like my pro wrestling, so I get it. You know, they're probably looking at me like, what a fucking weirdo, you know? But I, I don't judge. I think it's cool. But I, I don't watch any shows. I don't, to my knowledge, I don't think I've ever really watched any anime shows. I don't think. Not animation. I know, I know there's a difference there. But I've never really, that's never really done much for me. But it's really cool that people are into it and follow it and whatnot and are passionate about it. And that's awesome. Um, and then lastly, what's your favorite thing to do in the world? Also, my birthday's on Sunday. Well, first and foremost, happy birthday. Happy early birthday. Enjoy it watching. No wrestling pay-per-views. Thank God there's no shows on this week. I've been so backed up because there were four four shows on this weekend between the two Ring of Honor shows and then Impact Hard to Kill, their pay-per-view, and then the NXT UK Blackpool 2 show. It's like, holy shit. Uh, that, that's fucking crazy. But uh, anyway, my favorite thing to do in the world, a um, couple different things. One, hang out with my girlfriend. I mean, nothing really beats you know being with Alexis. Um, I know that might be the safe answer, but it's true. That, uh, watching wrestling, but the issue with watching wrestling is that 95% of the time I'm covering what I'm watching, so it's hard to multitask sometimes. I love just sitting down and watching a movie. I really do, because I don't have to cover it. I don't have to pay attention too much. I can just chill the fuck out. I don't really get to do that often because I'm very busy most of the time. Um, I just like being able to hang out and go to the movies, watch a movie. That's one of my favorite things to do. Usually with Alexis. I mean, it kind of goes hand in hand. And then you know what? This answer dawned on me last night when I was thinking about your question. Obviously, coincidentally enough, because I was going to bed, sleeping. There is no better feeling after a long day. And I usually go to bed pretty late. Not because I choose to, but because I kind of have to, because I have to get shit done for the following day. Um, You know, people ask me all the time, like, oh, why do you go to bed so late? Why don't you do your work during the day? Which is kind of a dumb argument. Um, because I do do my work in the day and it just takes a long time to do. And, uh, you know, I, I can't just kind of go home and turn everything off. I mean, un- unfortunately, I don't really live like that. But anyway, um, I'm up usually pretty late sometimes. I went to bed on the earlier side last night and there is nothing better than just going to bed and knowing you're going to sleep and just laying down and just going to bed. It's such an underrated aspect of life, going to sleep. I fucking love it. But, um, anyway, uh, yeah, sleeping hanging out with Alexis, watching wrestling, and going to see movies at a movie theater. That, that's usually my top four things. I'm not a big travel guy. I do enjoy travel, but it's just way too fucking hectic. Um, I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't really go out any pla- many places. I, I go to wrestling shows. Those are fun, but even those can be hectic sometimes, scheduling it and paying for the tickets, obviously. And you know, It's always a fun time, but it can be a lot. It adds up over time. So just hanging out, chilling are usually my favorite things to do that don't involve going anywhere or doing anything work-related. And that's going to do it, guys, for episode 320 here today. I made it, even though with my voice being in shambles here. Um, I appreciate you guys making it through the end with me. I appreciate it very much. Um, there were a few episodes, a few point of the episodes I had to go back and re-record, because I guess I didn't record them, because my storage on my laptop was uh, has been low. I mean, I guess I got to delete some shit, because I make videos and audio shit on here all the time. I got to delete some stuff. But I went back and re-recorded it. Hopefully, you didn't even notice 
where I had to go back and fill in the spots. It wasn't anything too extreme, so I thought it would be like it wouldn't save at all. Um, that That's happened before. Could you imagine my voice being the way that it is right now? And then I go to record, and it doesn't record. I cannot tell you how many times that's happened. And it's not something that's my fault. Um, just audacity crashes sometimes, and it's it's beyond my control. And it's just uh, it's a bad situation. It's 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 more depressing than it is frustrating knowing I have to go back and re-record. But hey, that's what I do. I enjoy doing the show. I enjoy you guys. If you want to send in a question to the show, you can do so by tweeting me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRant with the hashtag AskGSM. Find me on Facebook at Facebook.com backslash Graham.GSM.Matthews. Leave a question on the post I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not on the wall itself. And last but certainly not least, drop your question down below in the comment section of this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. So next week, the big Royal Rumble Go Home Show, which I cannot fucking wait for. Um, and keep your eyes out for any um, details regarding the 2020 Royal Rumble game on nextairwrestling.net. You can sign up for two spots, one of the men's, one of the women's. And um, if your number wins, whatever number you pick and whoever enters that number wins the entire match, if they enter that number and win the whole Rumble then you win a free t-shirt, either a WrestleRant Radio t-shirt or the t-shirt of whoever won. So, hey, I, I've been doing that for a couple years now. I enjoy the game. I know a lot of other people do too. So jump in on it. No better year to get started than in 2020. So the eighth annual Royal Rumble game will kick off with details and whatnot very soon. So stay tuned for that um, here on the channel and more importantly on nextairwrestling.net and all my social media pages. So until next week, guys, have a great rest of your week. I got to go rest my voice. I got to record a whole episode of WrestleRant Radio tomorrow. Hopefully it's better by then. I doubt it will be. So we'll uh, trudge along through it like, a lot like we did today. Till then, guys, have a great one. I'm Graham G. So Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.